Hey everybody, welcome back to the CNC with Dave show. This is episode number 10. Um, we've got a pretty good show for you tonight. We're kind of going to just take some question and answer deals and uh, we've got some uh, little demonstrations that my buddy Juan's going to show us. So uh, we'll start off and let everybody introduce themselves. Looks like we've got kind of a small panel tonight. Uh, but let's start. I'll start over on the other side. We'll go. We'll start with uh, Richard. Richard, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, tell everybody where they can find you? Yeah, uh, name's Rich Muller. I go by uh, Shade Tree CNC. Seems like a lot of people can't make the connection most of the time. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on uh, YouTube. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on uh, Snapchat. All under the same name. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate Thank you being here tonight. Next, we've got Melinda Davies. Hey, guys. I'm Melinda Davies. About the only place you can find me is on Facebook. Um, right now, I don't do a lot there, but that's where you can find me. Okay. Thanks, Melinda. And next, we've got Mark Lindsay. Howdy, y'all. Uh, Mark Lindsay, and you can find me both down in the YouTube comments. You can find me on my YouTube channel under this name, Mark Lindsay, and I'm most most active on uh, Facebook in various guitar and woodworking and CNC related groups under this name again, Mark Lindsay. And okay. I'm here to take your questions tonight, so bring them on, y'all. Mark. You're going to be watching the chat again, I guess, so uh, if you've got any uh, questions related to Hobby CNC, whether it be Mach 3 or even something else for that matter, we'll, uh, shoot them in the chat, and Mark will be uh, checking those out for us. Okay, uh, finally we got Juan Lopez there. Juan, you want to tell everybody uh, who you are and where they can find you? Sure. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Juan Lopez. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, G Code One Design. I also have Instagram and Facebook. Um, not that active on Instagram, but uh, YouTube. You can find me there. Thanks, Dave. Okay, thank you very much, Juan. And you say we already got some questions over there, Mark? No, not over on YouTube yet. I have a few questions here that. Uh, one of our viewers sent in earlier. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, let's let's just go ahead. We'll start with those, I guess. Oh, okay. All right. Well, these uh, all four of these come from uh, Jim Sinicola, and uh, we can take them in whichever uh, order uh, you want to go. Probably the um, easier one would be how do you set up motors? How do you slave motors on an axis in Mach three? Oh, that's uh, that's a pretty easy one. Uh, Juan, since you've got your screen share working there, you already got Mach 3 up, I guess? Uh, no, that was actually a video I was screen sharing with you guys. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I can I can do it here. Bear with me a second, folks, and I'll pull uh, Mach 3 up here. And then when it gets up here, I'll do a screen share. Okay, for those of you who may not know what slaving motors is, that's basically where you, if you have an axis that is driven by two separate motors, you're going to set it up so that both motors operate simultaneously. Okay, if this thing works a little slow with all this other stuff going on, but I've almost got this up here where we can see it. That's okay, so do I. That's why I had to use this computer, too. tried the video on the laptop, and it just would not cooperate. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm hoping when I screen share this, we can see everything that we need to see. Uh, let's see, where is that screen share? Is is Jim watching in the chat? Uh, uh, yes, he is. Okay. Okay. Can everybody see my Mach three screen? 
Yes. Okay, so the way to share is you just come down here to config and come down to slave access. Can y'all see that little pop-up window? I bet you can't see that, right? Nope. No, I can't see it. Oh, okay. Well, you'll just have to take my word for it then, folks. When you, when you hit that slave access, a little window opens up, and it's got X, Y, and Z, and then it has a little box that says slave access, and you check uh, which axis you want. And in my case, I have the A axis slaved with the Y axis because I use two stepper motors to, uh, to drive my Y axis. So uh, another point I'll mention about that when you have the axis slaved, when you do your motor tuning, and I know you're not going to be able to see this either probably when this pops up. Yeah, you probably, I'm sure you can't see that. But anyway, when you go to set your motor tuning, there's a way to set it for the A axis, but if you're using the A axis slaved with any of the other axes, you don't need to put anything in there. You can leave that for default. And as I look at mine, I've never changed it. It's still got all the default stuff in there. But it's because it's slaved, it's picking up all its information off of whatever axis you got it slaved with, with, in my case, the Y. So I did that screen share probably for nothing because you really couldn't see the stuff you needed to see. I'll leave this open, uh, and I'll stop sharing here. Maybe I can. Yeah, Patrick over at Patrick's workshop, workshop says uh, share the, your entire screen, not just uh, selected part. Oh, okay. Thanks, Patrick. Let me go back and try that again then. Yeah, uh, entire screen. Patrick's a smart guy. <laughs> Okay, I'm trying to see. I don't see where it gives me that option. I mean, I've got that window. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Here we go. You got a little My pop bad. up. There we go. Okay, so now, yeah, that's it. I told you that, Patrick. He's a smart guy. <laughs> now, if I can get back to. Uh, Mach 3, because I've got this little window in the way here. Okay, now, let's see if y'all can see this. When I come down to the slave axis, can you there see that is. now? Yeah, yeah. There, there it is. is. Hot diggity. Okay, so, and here I go again. I'm pointing with my finger like y'all can see my finger. Uh, you can see right there in the middle it has the A axis, a little radio button right there with, with the Y axis. So that's how you... Uh, Point with your cursor, Dan. Yeah, right there. Okay, and also now that you can see all this stuff, I'll go back and show you the other thing that I was talking about is when you do your motor tuning, since you've got that, uh, here you can see I've got 6,400 steps per on my X, Y, and my Z, and you'll notice on my A, that's still the default settings that was in Mach 3 when I first you know, installed it, and I don't I really have to work. You could put something in there, but it doesn't really matter. It's it's picking up all its information since I told it to slave with the Y. It's reading those numbers, so you don't really have to set it up. Doesn't hurt anything if you do. It's just it doesn't use that. Okay. There you go. Let me right. uh, get out of here. That that's pretty cool, Patrick. I'm glad you got me straightened out on the screen sharing thing. I was hitting the wrong wrong deal. All right. Okay. And what were you hitting before, Dave, that you weren't sharing the whole thing? Well, I, I was clicking on the picture that showed Mach 3, ah. you know, my main page, but then it wouldn't, open, you know, it wouldn't do the other one. I, I wasn't, the entire screen was on the far left. That's I, the one got, I, I got you. Here. I understand what you were doing. Seems like uh, I just uh, seen those pages though, about a few hours ago. By the way, uh, Mark, if Patrick's out there, if he wants to join the show, uh, go ahead and send him the link. Okay, will do. <laughs> okay, and while I'm doing that, uh, Jim also wants to know, do you need a home position for changing out a tool? Well, 
Well, let's see. <laughs> I normally what I do, you know, again, this is just how I do things. Um, when when I'm run, if I've got a tool chain, say I'm running a a V carve bit like a 60 degree V bit or something, and it's engraving, and then it's then then I got to come back with maybe a quarter end mill or something to part it out. Uh, you know, when I run the first program, it's automatically going to go back to wherever I referenced home. So usually, I just, you know, when it goes there, I may raise the Z up a little bit higher so that I can, you know, get the tool out, and then I just change it right there, and, you know, then bring it back down and reset the Z, and then off I'm, you know, load the other program, and, program, and away I go. Uh, so. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could, if if you're, let's say for example, you're cutting something really big, and you set your home reference right in the center of the material. Well, now when you go to change that bit, you don't want to have to reach over the material. You can still jog that Z up so that you can get the tool out and bring the X forward, or I'm sorry, the Y forward, so you can change it out. Uh, you know, change it out. Then make sure when you set your Z height, just click. Zero Z. Don't touch. Don't touch the Y. And then you can raise it back up and hit go to zero, and it'll go right back to the center of the, you know, center of the blank where it was before. So I hope I hope he understood that, or everybody understood what I was saying there. It's a whole lot easier to show folks, but I, um, I don't have a CNC in here to do it. And I'm not going out in that hot garage tonight. Sorry. Oh come on. <laughs> oh, it's been terrible out there today. I was out there in it working on a car. Yeah. Someone yeah, asked me the same today. thing today. I got uh, now when you uh, you showed me how you did it. You referenced to the center of the uh, of the um, whatever you're cutting because uh, we did it on those parts, uh, Dave. But uh, my question is is Correct me if I'm wrong. Once we centered it and you took it down and you zeroed it out onto the uh, the top of the material, you stopped and turned off your box and then raised the uh, bit up. Correct? Before you act and then turned the box back on before you actually hit the start to run the program. Is that not how you did it? Uh, yeah. Say say that one more time. Okay. When we were getting ready to cut out your parts. Yeah. We brought it over and you centered it, and then you brought it down and touched the material to tell it, okay, this is home, and you zeroed it out at that point. Yeah. All right. At that point, you went over and turned your box off, and then you raised the bit up a little bit. Then you went back and turned the box back on, and then well, we went over and hit Start. I, what I did is I, I get it centered over my little mark that I put on the workpiece, and I turn the box off before I bring it down. I, you know, I bring it down with, you know, to get it close, but then I shut shut the controller off so that I can freely turn that knob to set the to set the Z right on top of the paper. Okay. Then once I've got it all zeroed out, then I turn the box back on to you know turn the power back on to rate to use the button to raise the Z back up. Okay, that's where I was making. Uh, that's I see what you're talking about now. Yeah, because see when you, when you try to when you try to like you know how I have that knob on top of my Z. Right, right. And that's and that's and somebody asked me on Facebook today. I, I posted a picture and they were asking about the knob. But so if, if that person's watching, yeah, that's what it's for is to make it easy to to raise and lower the Z manually when you have the power turned off. You, you can't really crank on those things when you've got the power on. Right. Uh, Trust if me. If you really that's... wanted to, you could probably turn it, but you, you don't need to. You need to turn the power off, and then it will turn real easy where you can set your Z. And then once you have it zeroed out, then you just turn the power back on and use the button to raise it back up. And in my case, I always use like a piece of paper uh, to get the, you know, to get it set right on top of the material, or give or take a few thousand. When you when you say that, it makes me laugh because today when I was running through that program, I went to lift it and I forgot to turn the box off, and I tried to turn the knob to lift to lift it up, and I thought to myself, wow. 
something's in a bind. It's, it didn't it turn really freely before, and now that you say that, I realize it didn't turn the box off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that 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 power is trying to hold that motor in that place, so yeah, it doesn't want to turn. Uh, and I do have some good news for you. Remember how you said that 690 might be a little heavy on that gantry on the on mine? Yeah, working good. I, it lifts and it. You can tell when it goes to lift it. Uh, I listen to you by. I can compare mine to your five uh, four by four. I mean, but when it goes to lift it, you can hear it's a little bit. You know. Not struggling by any means, but you can hear the difference. There's a lot of difference in the sound of it trying to lift it and rather than pushing it down because that router is so heavy. But it, I got to thinking that's the same motors you're using on that big green machine, correct? Uh, no, it's it's the the 690 is what I'm using on the uh, Garage Works 4x4, but that that big green one I'm using the Porter Cable 7518. That's a three and a quarter horse. I understand that, but you're using the same stepper motors to lift that big. Oh, stepper. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, so they've got motors. plenty of power. It's not the stepper motors. If it'll lift that, it'll lift your big router. It'll dang sure lift my 690 without any problem. In other words. Yeah. Well, really, I mean, it's not. It's not so much the the motor lifting, and it's more just that weight hanging off. You know, cantilevered out off the. Yeah. Well, I, I watched it today when I ran it through the, uh, I, what I did is I've got a sign I want to cut, and I just set the program up and left the router way up in the air and told it that's zero and hit run, and it started running through the motion like it was cutting, and watched the gantry as it went up and down, and it it didn't bend, it didn't flex, no nothing. So. Yeah. yeah, well, it looks like you got a really good mount on there, too, so. Yeah. Like you really, you got a really nice CNC, is what you got. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that helps too. Yeah, yeah. It, it helps. It helps when you uh, got an expert designing stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, Mark, you got you got some more questions coming there. Right? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, put this, I'm gonna put the screen on you because Rocky's telling me he needs to go out, so I'm gonna have to get up. <laughs> well, okay, uh, uh, but before shows. you do. Uh, Charles Steed wants to know, back to the slaving the axes, doesn't one of the slave axes have to be reversed so that the gantry doesn't rack on you? And my answer to that is no, it does not. I don't remember having to do that either, Mark. No, it, um, it does not. Uh, you, both of your motors should be mounted on the same end of your machine. So they should both be turning in the same direction, moving the gantry whichever direction you're uh, attempting to move. So if if you reverse one motor on that axis, then you're getting into a racking because one will be backing up while the other is moving forward. But no, um, when you slay the axis, they should be running the same direction. I, w I will say that too, that yes, they have to both run the same direction. Uh, Dave just walked me through the setup on mine this afternoon and... Those were not reversed. Well, uh, on the X car, the uh, far motor is reversed. That's correct. Yeah, because they're kind of pointing at each other. Yeah, on the X -car. right. But on the lead screw system, they're both pointing the same yeah, in the same direction. Exactly. They're parallel to that uh, axis. So, okay. Um, uh, Al Fort, Odessa Woodworking says servo motors versus stepper motors. He knows they're not the same. What is the difference? Um, money? Yeah, <laughs> money is probably the biggest difference. Uh, stepper motors are a lot cheaper. And, and, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as my knowledge about, because I'm not an electronics guy, everybody should know that. The stepper motors work off of pulses, you know, uh, step and direction uh, pulses. Uh, and as far as I know, servo motors have to have some kind of an encoder to keep up with the uh, where it's at, you know, and stuff like that. So, and you know, they're stepper motors are. I mean, excuse me, servo motors are probably a lot nicer if you can afford them, but they're a lot more expensive. So. Stepper yeah. motors are more for the, uh, you know, garage type guys like me. 
<laughs> yeah. Folks with less than five figures invested in their machine. Yeah. And, and you know, I don't need to have you know, I don't need to have a thousand <laughs> minute rapid speeds and all that stuff because my machines aren't that big to start with. So I just if I had that kind of speed I'd probably just crash it a whole lot more. So stepper mode is a very economical choice for for you know these smaller machines. Okay, uh, and one last question from Jim Sinicola. In Mach 3, when you're tuning your motors, what is which is the best turning pro tuning profile for your motors? A shallow slope, or do you want it to go nearly vertical on that uh, screen there that you had out? Uh, Sounds like Rich knows what he's talking about, <laughs> what I'm talking about. Uh, I have tried that on my machine here to where I went almost vertical. And I'm using quarter-inch drive shafts and couples, and I can literally twist the end off a, a quarter-inch drive shaft uh, going vertical. Don't I have that. to I have to start out slow in order to <laughs> to take advantage of the power of those motors. Yeah, I I can uh, I can do a screen share because I don't even I I think mine kind of go up and then flatten out and. Let me uh, let me do a screen share here and uh, if I can get to do this right. Thanks for the screen share tip there, Patrick. No problem. You're on it, buddy. I've been doing this for quite some time. <laughs> let me see if I can. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's go see what my. Uh, can y'all see this now? Yep. Yep. Okay, there's what mine looks like, and I don't know if it's right or not. You know, I just know it works. I always thought the velocity had to do with, uh, with the slope. Yep. Yeah. Well, I know this right here. You can see mine's 199.98. I'll put in 200, and that's what it always ends up changing it to. But that's basically about what my rapids are. It's right at 200 okay. inches a minute. It, it really matters is how heavy your gantries are. Because it's the amount of mass that you're trying to move. Yeah. And, you know, I just, you know, I, like I said, I'm not an electronic guy, so I, I can't look at that and really know what the heck I'm looking at. All I know is I just, you know, adjust stuff to get it to where it moves without freezing up or something. Well, is that all of Jim's questions, Mark? Yes, sir. That was um, uh, all of Jim's questions. Okay. Thank okay. you, Jim, for all those great questions. That's good questions. Can, can, um, I, inter can I interject something here at this point? You certainly oh, may. Okay. So before we change subjects here, uh, we, we were talking about slaving a, uh, a fourth stepper motor in a single axis. You can actually do that without using Mach 3 to do that. What you do is you take your two individual motor drivers and you take your step and direction and wire them exactly the same on both uh, of your motor drivers. Then on your stepper motors, if they're turning like Dave's units, everything stays the same. So both, both drivers get the same step and direction. And they, Mach 3 doesn't even know that there's two motors out there. If you're doing like an X carve and you want one motor to turn clockwise and the other motor to turn uh, counterclockwise, all you do is take the uh, the B plus and B minus off your stepper motors and switch them. It'll cause your motor to run the opposite direction. Okay. There you go. You follow that at all? No. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I did. I did. Start talking about electronic stuff. You're like, yeah. who's, who said as no? I, <laughs> as, I, as I look around this panel here, uh, I seem to be the very last one that doesn't have a CNC of any type. And I was no, pissed. Yeah, what's, what's up with that, Meadows? I, uh, I really wanted the other Russ to be the last one. I wanted to get one ahead of him. <laughs> Hey, snooze, snooze, he, you lose, buddy. He screws. He screwed me up, man. He went over there without telling anybody. Dang it! <laughs> but uh, I under I understood uh, what Richard was saying because I have that electronic bin, 
and I'm the only one that can't put it in practice. Man, I, I don't like that. Well, it almost sounds like it's useful if if you want to still use your slave motors and add an A axis without having to unhook one of your slave motors, right? Yeah, if you have a driver that only has uh, uh, four outputs, as an example, you you buy a cheap one off of eBay or something like that, right? And, and you and you have two motors on a single axis, that you you consume that if you use Mach three to drive that slave motor, right? But, but if you if you parallel your step on both motor drivers and your direction on both motor drivers. You're only using one output, your X or Y output off your off of your uh, breakout board, and it's sending that pulse to both motor drivers exactly at the same time. So both of those motors are going to respond a a as if they were one motor. Yeah, that's exactly how the X carve is set up. They only have three drivers. That's correct. Yeah. The so different the, the difference is on the X carve is like I was saying on the stepper motors themselves. If you're talking a four-wire system, you take the A plus and the A uh, A minus leads and connect them just like all the other motors. But if you want to reverse the rotation of that particular motor, you switch the B plus and the B minus so that that motor will now run in reverse. Yeah, I comprendo. Yeah, they look like some kind of gang sign you did in there, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we got a couple of questions here uh, from Eric E. He wants to know on your new uh, plywood machine plans, uh, what length uh, lead screws are recommended for the gantry? He's not sure he saw that noted unless he just missed it somewhere. Hmm. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, I know who you're talking about. Uh, isn't that basically up to you, depending on how wide you make the gantry? Yeah, I mean, I didn't put I didn't put the actual dimensions because you know the plans are so easy to modify. It's okay. it's kind of like you know, and that's you know I've told people before in in the videos I did you know a couple of years ago. That's like one of the last things you put on. <laughs> you know, all I can tell you is the best rule of thumb is measure twice, cut once. Okay, my. <laughs> And always start with the longest one first. That way, if you screw it up, you can use it for one of the other ones. Okay, my Not mistake. That I've never done that or anything. He just came in and clarified. Not the lead screw, just the fasteners. What length screws are you putting it together with? <laughs> oh, the oh the uh, the fasteners. Yeah. Um, well, if anybody, uh, and I know Eric probably saw it, uh, the big green monster that I've been building out there, uh, you know, putting a plywood gantry on it. I have been using uh, one and five-eighths deck screws for some of it, and then I use some two and a half inch deck screws for other things, depending on how, how much stuff I'm going through. And that, that sucker is like rock solid. It's it's unbelievable. You know, you, you build a... Uh, you know, anytime you build a gantry out of plywood like that, if you make a box, that sucker's strong. Mm. Yeah. So it's like a torque box, yeah. Yeah. Torsion uh, box, excuse me. You know, and, and like I said, screws are cheap. You know, you go to Lowe's, you, you know, for thirty bucks, you can get a great big old tub of deck mm. screws. Uh, so, you know, I put I put a bunch of them in there. You know, I've got them. I remember my spacing on it. I think it was like. Every three and five eighths inches or something, I'm putting a screw. Maybe overkill, but I figure what the heck, screws are cheap. Uh, you know, put them in there. In construction, I used to make, uh, if you needed like a, a, a wooden beam, for instance, you would take like a two by six or two two by sixes, and then you would put three quarter inch plywood, cut it the same thickness or the same width. So it'd be five and a half, and so you would have a two by six, three quarter inch plywood, and another two by six, and glue those and screw those together, and you that plywood will not let those beam that will go anywhere. It will reinforce those that solid wood beam, and it won't go anywhere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the oh. other rust needs to get started on one of those CNCs. 
Yeah, the, the non CNC Russ. The non yeah. That's the one you're talking get, about. He needs to start building one of your wooden ones. <laughs> I don't want the wooden ones. I want that safety orange. Oh, you, you, you. It's all about you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you sure you're talking to my wife? I'm sure Dave will send you. A, I'm sure Dave will send you a can of spray paint. <laughs> hey, you uh, know, I looked all over for safety orange spray paint. That's hard to find. <laughs> I can't believe that he sit right there and said that he wanted to make sure that he got one before me. I wanted you to be the last one. By God, it worked. I'm the last. Yeah. Well, it it doesn't really matter if you're the last one that gets one, as long as you get one, Russ. You know. Yeah. Another month or two. And I'm, I'm there. What size, what size are you looking at? I'll, I'll make sure I have one in stock for you. Either one he got or the or the four by four. I don't remember which. I have yeah. to go with the four by four, Russ. Face constructions. Well, you know, um, as I was working on that big green one today, and I'm still going to do another build because I'm going to build another uh, one from those plywood plants to shoot videos and stuff. Because I haven't done any videos to kind of go along with the the plans, but you know, my garage is filling up pretty quick out there. I've, I've got that uh, 4x4 demo that, uh, you know, is kind of getting in the way now. So That's mine? I may have to uh, I may have to make somebody a sweet deal on that one. <laughs> you better go for a drive there, Russ. <laughs> uh, i got a truck it'll fit in the back of it. Sweet. You're going to say bring something bigger than a Camaro. Yeah, <laughs> I'd I'd bet it to the roof of my car if I needed to. And bring and bring bring work clothes. You know. Oh, that's right. You do have to the work, don't you? Work clothes for the training. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Russ has already told us about that, so we're ready. Okay. All right. I got news for you, though. Uh, it's. It's one thing to watch a video. It's one thing for somebody to tell you how to do something. But when you he let me actual run the machine myself, showed me and how to do it. That's that's the best stuff in the world right there. Yeah, you you got to drive it yourself and kick the tires and stuff like that. That's how you learn how to do stuff. Yep. Yep. But uh, I, I I've always said you know it's not rocket science. You give me ten minutes with anybody. I don't care how stupid they are. Even Russ, I can show them how to run a machine. <laughs> the other <laughs> Russ, not this one. <laughs> Russ I'll let you guys figure out which Russ I was talking about. Russ Meadows, not Russ Clary. That's beautiful. I, I love it. <laughs> okay, uh, Mark. Before we totally derail this show here, uh, we got any more questions over there? I love how you say "before we derail the show." Anyway, uh, <laughs> we have a question from Lyle. I, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Foyt. Uh, he says, it may be off topic, but how big of a machine can I run with 130 torque servos? I think he means 130 inch-pound torque steppers. Not very big, right? Uh, well, or you know, yeah, I guess it depends on how you build it. If you... If X cars are about 82 inch ounce motors. Yeah. Are they? So yeah, that's what I mean. If you build it pretty light, you know, where you're not pushing a whole bunch of stuff around, uh, you know. Yeah, these I don't motors know. are five I, I, times as strong. What's that, Richard? These motors that we're using, the four uh, 425s. Yeah. They're five. They're five times as strong as the X cars motors. Yeah. Yeah, here's a little baby X carve uh, one right here. Yeah, right, isn't it exactly. cute? <laughs> <laughs> ain't it cute? Ain't it cute? It's pretty. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, we got we got any more questions, Mark? Yes, we, we do. Get, we've uh, got we've, we've got two more, and um, I was just told by Lyle Foyt that absolutely perfect on his name pronunciation. It's because I was stationed in Germany, and there's a town pronounced spelt that way, pronounced Foyt. Anyway, um, and another question: Why don't I see more of you guys using touch plates instead of the paper method to set your z-axis? Well, question. you do you do see me using a touch plate. My paper's better. So. My paper's cheap. Yeah. I mean, I always have a piece of paper laying around. I, Requires no code. 
Yeah, Neither does my touch I mean, plate. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with using one of those touch plates, and, and I know a lot of guys are into that and want to build their own and all that stuff, and that's great. But you just don't need it. I mean, you can use a piece of paper, and it works just as good. I, yeah. Let me let me ask you the group a question here on the panel. What are what are all you guys using to um, during uh, touching off and zeroing? Are you actually trying to move your machine at the keyboard, or are you using some controller like this? I use a keyboard. I'm looking for a controller, but I use a keyboard. Now yes. I use I use this here at home, and I use a wireless touchpad keyboard at work. Both work really well. I manually turn the uh, the thread. Now that's a good method. Yeah, I I'm like Juan. I I you know I just take my laptop out there to run things, and I don't have any of those fancy bells and whistles already out there. I just plug it up and. Use the key, you know, the buttons on the keyboard to get it close, and then go from there. I use and most of the time, most of the time too, when I'm doing stuff, I'm put, cutting stuff that's inside a skeleton, so it's not, you know, when I put my little mark in the center or whatever, it's not, you know, it's not that critical that I get it perfect right. because right. it's all in a skeleton. Uh, you know, as long as I line the X and Y up by eye. And then of course set my Z with a piece of paper. I'm good. That's all. That's all the precision I need. I use an Xbox 360 controller, mm. and it's got its good points and its bad points. I mean, I'm holding up my hand. I got the bright red button right there for e stop. Uh, but it, it, the bad thing about it is, I get so used to using the Xbox 360 controller. For instance, I had to send a message to Juan last night to ask him how the heck to find the jog screen. <laughs> on Mach 3, because I know on my controller I push the A button, and that's it. But I couldn't find it in the controls. So he set me straight. Interesting. So. Is that controller wired up through Bluetooth? Uh, no, uh, I have the wired USB controller, but you can okay. use the wireless. And it's uh, there's a uh, plug-in over on Mach 3's website. And um, download it, run it, plug it in, and boom, you're on the air. I haven't tried it, but doesn't it come with its own uh, wind? Like when you put the plug in, it's on the actual interface. It'll show the the controller, and you set whatever you want on there, Mark. Yeah, it does. You, you can cool. set the controller buttons. I've got mine to where the left joystick uh, operates my x-axis front to rear, and the when I move it up and down, it runs the y-axis, and then on the right joystick, up and down, I have the Z going up or down. And uh, panic button right there. I have the start button right in the middle, so I have to let go. I hit the start button, and that's uh, to run the uh, G code. Um, and just all kinds of different buttons programmed for everything. I mean, and it's yeah, all right there's, there. There's a question in the chat here, Mark. It says, does Mark CNC play World of Warcraft 2? <laughs> yes, it does. No. Not. <laughs> No, it does not, because I don't. I'm not a gamer. Maybe the yeah. occasional solitaire, because I know me. If I started playing games, that's all I would do. <laughs> now, did you say you use the Xbox controller that you plug it into your USB port on your computer? Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, it, uh, I use the wired ones simply because I'm really, really bad about putting a wireless something down and not knowing where the hell it is. So, also, my shop is so close, I can walk outside with it in my hand. <laughs> so, mm. it's, you know. Nice thing no you know it's in the freezer in the morning, you know? It could be. It very mm. well could be. And usually turned on so the batteries go dead. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, we do have one big question here. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's off topic. So uh, I know Juan had another presentation he wanted to do for Mach 3, so I'll save that for uh, a little bit later on, but it's Joe BMH, your question is coming up. <laughs> okay, yeah, my, I asked Juan the other day if he could, uh, you know, do a demonstration uh, on how to uh, do the calibration procedure, and I know he's perfected that. Uh, I watched his little thing on Facebook the other day. So uh, 
let's go ahead and, and do that because uh, it seems like I saw some questions on Facebook a few days ago about that, and I know I got some emails. Uh, Rick, I, hope, I don't know if Rick's watching out there on the chat, but if you're watching Rick, Juan is about to show you the proper way to do the calibration procedure with Mach 3. Take her away, Juan. All right. Um, well, if you're using the Xylotech kit, uh, the 6400 is where you want to be. I'll tell you that up front as far as the steps are concerned. And uh, I've, I've tried it with a test indicator, and I've gone from one surface to the next with uh, a zero tolerance by that, I mean, not one thousandths, two thousandths, zero, zero tolerance. So it's right on the money. And that's, of course, with the Xylotech, Xylotex kit and uh, the Acme threads that we use. But uh, here is the way, in case uh, you have to adjust it for any reason. And this is just a video. I went ahead and took a video because I know doing it live and trying to get the camera there live is pretty hard to do. So. I'll go ahead and try to run that video for you and try to walk you through it. Yeah, I know when I watched it the other day, Juan, I kept expecting to see like two or three thou or something like that, and it was amazing how that came out. Right. It definitely... Let me see. I don't know if you guys can see that. Yep. Yep. If you could lock it on Juan there, please, Dave. We're seeing yeah, Patrick. It's, it's locked on him. Okay. All right, so there I set it at zero on that uh, square ruler, and I'm doing it with the ruler because doing it with the test indicator would be harder. You go to motor tuning. That's what I had it set at. I'm going to take it off of that just to, to show for show purposes. Uh, here I'm setting it at 3,200, I believe. Yeah, which happens to be the correct numbers if you're using one eighth setting on that instead of the one sixteenth like they are now. So I'll go ahead and tell it to move uh, eight inches on the X, and I'm only going to do it on the X, but uh, this applies to every axis or axes. I like using MDI. So. <laughs> So G54, GOX8, as you can see, it only went up to four. So if yours is having some kind of problem and it's not where you commanded it to go to, this is a process that you would you would take here. As you can see on the DRO, X is supposed to be 8 inches, and it's not. So I'm just going to take it back to zero so I don't have to re-zero it every time before I do the adjustments. I didn't have to put the Y, but... Okay, so now that we're at zero, I'm going to go ahead and use the plug-in or whatever it's called that comes in with Mach 3 that actually lets you adjust it. It's on the settings tab. And right beside the reset button, the calibration, axis calibration. And then a window comes up. And, of course, it's the x-axis. Hit OK. Another window pops up. How far would you like to move the x-axis? Axis? And I'm going to put 8 inches. Hit OK, and it'll move to what it thinks it's 8 inches. And we all knew it was going to be on 4. Mm -hmm. So here's where it, it asks you how much did it actually move. How far did the x-axis move? You tell it what you got. And there it gives you the steps that you need, which is 6,400. 
and just accept it, and it automatically puts that into your motor tuning. You don't have to go back and enter it. Now, since you did that movement, uh, it will show in your DRO some big number, as you can see right here when I go to MDI. See how it's 13 instead of the 8? So just zero it there, and you know you're at 4 inches. So just go back to 4 inches and zero it again. I was doing this on my phone and with one hand, so it's a little slow. So there you're back at the zero point. And you could do this with indicators if you want to just want to see that two, three thousandths difference. I did it, but it's a little more involved. You have to adjust your surfaces and all that. So this is just a, a fast way to do it to show you the process. So now I go to G54GOX8, and it should be adjusted to eight inches. And there it is. Mm -hmm. That's sweet. Yeah, and basically it's just the same procedure for each axis. I found when I built mine at work, I, I went 48 inches across, uh, and it turns out that the lead screw had a plus or minus two thousandths on the... Uh, on the lead screw, and it ended up being uh, 48 inches point one. So we ended up having to use that same calibration to adjust for the added uh, one mil per two revs uh, on that lead screw. They're not all perfect. Right. But that just goes to show you how accurate you can get if you were out. 0.1 over the course of four foot, and you could adjust that and calibrate it to eliminate that 0.1. Yep. Yep. You know. Okay, I have a question on uh, the video you just played there, Juan, from Nathan Longfellow. He says, "I'm not using the Xylotex kit. Would I still want to set my Gecko 540 to 6,400 steps per inch?" Um, that would have to, you'd have to look at your, your motors, and they usually give you that information. He has to investigate the, what is it, turns per inch or turns per... The, the 6400 number is, is, works with Xylotex because his, uh, Jeff at Xylotex sets those up to be one sixteenth step. Uh, you know, I don't know what the geckos would be. If, if they're one, you know, if they're one sixteenth, and you're using everything else is the same, same lead screws and all that, then yeah, it would probably be 6,400. If it's one eight step, it would be probably be 3,200. Uh, but you'd have to check your your documentation that that came with whatever whatever kit you got. And then he would just go through the same calibration that you just demonstrated, right? Yeah. Try to get the try to get it to move one inch, and then measure how far it actually moved. That would give you the exact number. That. And that would put in the exact number. All right. Did that answer it there, Nathan? All right. Yes, he did. Yeah. I would recommend using something longer than an inch, though. The more, the longer the length you are, the more accurate you're going to be. Understood. Uh, I was using that as a, for instance, it would get you a little bit close. You know. If it moved three inches when you set an inch, you know you set it too high. Yeah, you don't want to go too far and then the machine be that much off and crash. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have one question here which is way off topic, but it's for you, Mr. Dave. Okay. It's from Joe BMH1. He says, I'd like Dave to show how he designs a project for his rotary axis if he has time. 
Uh, okay. Uh, we'll we'll save that for another show. I'll. Uh, okay. Because I haven't I haven't done that in a long time, uh, and you know I'm old and forgetful, so I'd have to refresh my memory to, to do it or go back and find one of my old programs. But uh, but yeah, we'll save that for another show, and uh, and go through that. I'd like to get where, uh, you know, like I said, I was out, out in a garage today, and, man, it was just god-awful hot out there. And I'm thinking uh, now that I have get uh, some of these machines done where I'm not, have, you know, really needing to keep the garage door open so much, I need to buy a window unit and put in the, the window there and, and add the dust collection, and then I can maybe do the show from right out there and, and be able to do some demonstration on some of these things where you can see the machine moving instead of me just sitting here talking about it. You know what? Uh, Nick just got one of those uh, split units for like 780 bucks. It's a really nice unit for a pretty good deal, actually. What? What's that, Patrick? You got a what? He just got one of those split AC units for his shop. Oh, okay. Okay. You talking That's about Nick Ferry? Yeah, those are a lot better than those uh, window units. Yeah, well, that so it'll do heat and AC. Yeah. Yeah, that would be good because I know I need I need heat out there in the. Although I don't mind being cold as much as I do hot. Okay. I'll uh, I'll shoot you a link to that. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Have another one, and uh, this is the big one for Juan. I know you posted a couple videos over on Facebook. But we have a lot of people wondering about soft limits. If you could kind of run through what they are and how do you set them up and why would you want them? Well, soft limits basically just so that you don't you there's a, a limit to where your machine can move or how far it can move. Uh, the best way I can describe it without showing it is uh, you'd have to manually set your machine home and uh, set it to a point where it's to you is the max and, and you don't want it to hit your corners so uh, you set your machine home there and then go and I forget if it's config or what tab it is but you go into the soft limits and then add your table size or how, how big of a size you want it to where you want it to stop it'll also give you where uh, the amount of space for it to slow down I believe it's set at one inch and uh, You'd have to set your machine home manually, and uh, from there you could move your machine wherever you want to go. Once you get to that point, it'll slow down and stop eventually. And you can still use your set your homes for your work for your workpiece anywhere you want within the table. And from there on, as long as your machine, there is a deal in Mach 3 where it says uh, where you activate your machine coordinates and you you activate your uh, soft limits. And that has the soft limits has to be on the machine coordinates just for as a reference for you to see where your on the DRO your machine coordinates and your work your work coordinates are. Yeah, and we were talking earlier, I think, right before we went live about uh, uh, limit switches and soft limits and stuff like that. And you know, I mean, you can use them; they're they're okay if you want to use them, but. Really, when you get familiar with your machine and get familiar with programming, whether it be VCar Pro or Aspire or whatever the heck you're using, uh, you know, you kind of you kind of learn that when you set it up and hit your you know reference a, a spot, you know it's not going to run off and hit the end or screw something up. So, you know, I know all kinds of guys like to go put limit switches and all that, and that's great, you know. I've just never never used them. I've been doing, you know, had my own little machine here now for 10 years or more, and I've never put a limit switch on anything. And I've never run off, you know, and crashed the end of the thing. You just, you know, you just learn how to, you know, especially with the software, you, you can kind of preview things. And um, another thing you can do, yeah, let me see if I can screen share real quick here. And we'll go. Here I was show. I was looking at that soft limits while Juan was talking about it. It's in the uh, motorhome slash soft limits thing under config. Um, 
But another thing you can do, let me see if I can load a program here real quick. I don't know what I got on here. Uh, we'll just pick this one. This is something me and Russ was playing around with the other day. Oh. <coughs> I guess y'all can y'all can see my screen, right? Yeah, I can see Mach three. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, okay. Um, and I I use this quite a bit. I I don't know if anybody else does or not, but up here at the top, you you know, most of the time I have it right here on this screen. But if you come over here to Toolpath, if you look right over here, it's got your program limits. And, you know, here again, I've, I've, let's see if I can get that. Well, anyway, I messed it up, I guess. Oh, here we go. So here's, here's the way it, it looks. And you can see that this, this little program was done from the center. So you can look right here and you can say, you know, in the program, this is the farthest it's ever going to go this way in the negative direction. This is the farthest it's ever going to go in a positive direction. So, you know, as long as you're starting there and, you know, you know what size your table is, it's never going to change. You know, you can kind of look right there and see if you're going to be close. Now, if if you're running something and you've got a table that's, I don't know, we'll, we'll just say 24 by 24, and you come over here and it's like 11.9 or something like that, then you know you're going to be pretty close. You can probably still run it, but you may want to try to, you know, not cut the material, what I call cut and air, where you just leave the Z up and, and kind of dry run it, and then you'll know whether you can find the sweet spot right in the center where you can reach everything. Does that make sense? It does make sense to me. Um, it, to me, the way I run it is I know what the capacity of my machine is. I mean, I can cut 24 by about 34. I just don't mount anything bigger than that on the spoil board. You know, I, I can't physically get anything that will cut out of limits onto the machine. So I've never had the problem. Yeah. You know? Yeah, well, that, that's what I mean. That That's a neat feature. If you know you've got something that's about the size and you're not sure, you can look right, yeah. you know, look there right quick and tell, yeah. uh, you know, the program. Another okay. thing, you can, another thing, and I think we talked about this in one of the other shows, too, is if you've got, say you've got a program uh, or a file that somebody sent you. You saw it on Facebook and they shared the file with you. But their table's a lot bigger than yours, and you cannot run that on your machine. You can still run it, not maybe not that size, but you can use that. If they send you the code and stuff, you can use the same code and just put, uh, what the heck was it, G50, G51? I can't even remember the scaling. But anyway, you can put those scaling things in there and scale it down so that it will fit on your machine, even though you're using the original code and again if you go to that spot where I was just at then it will tell you when you put that in there you know how big how big it's going to be when it goes past the, the the code to scale it so I hope I didn't confuse everybody just saying but no, you're fine okay okay I have one last question here and I think this one would probably be for Richard since he knows quite a bit about the free software side of this. Um, Alan Gilbert says, I'm wanting to make some guitar necks. What is a good, inexpensive, or free cam software for this application? There aren't any. Yeah. I can't yeah, I was going to say, and that's that. if you're doing a guitar neck, that's the... It's probably you're yeah. probably not gonna find something that's free that, that will do it. Yeah, you're looking at 3D rather than two and a half D. Most of your free stuff is either 2D or two and a half D. Yeah, um, I, I'm gonna go on a little personal statement here. Uh, it seems to me, just been talking with people all day long, uh, that for the home hobbyist, a machining a guitar neck is kind of like the holy grail. 
And um, there are plans out there. You can find some plans out there for purchase that are made for uh, VCAR Pro or Expire. Somebody else has done all the modeling for you. You buy the plan from them and uh, put the files in and off you go. But as far as modeling your own guitar neck, um, you're looking at some pretty high-powered software. You're looking at things like Rhino. Um, you're looking at SolidWorks. You're looking at um, some of the bigger, more deluxe software, uh, some of which will have like a five-figure price tag on it. Uh, personally, I'm on a quest to do the same thing. And I'm signed up to start classes in September um, to learn SolidWorks for just that reason. So right. I can learn how to 3D model it. Because uh, I have yet to find, and I've been on this, I've been looking for about five years now, and I have yet to find a free uh, program that has the controls that will let you model uh, something in 3D like that. Yeah, now if you're dealing with SolidWorks, uh, there is a plugin that you can add to SolidWorks, that's HMS Express. Mm -hmm. That will only give you two and a half D. Right. You will not. It will not do contours. You right. have to step up to their uh, HMS Works, which will allow you to do three-dimensional, uh, multi-axis uh, modeling, and that's an expensive add-on. Right. Uh, it's not free. Right. Now, I, I, I need to back up on regroup on that. There is one free open source program that I can think of, and that is Blender Cam. And Blender is a 3D modeling program, and the Blender Cam is a, uh, is, uh, a plug in like you were talking about uh, for SolidWorks. But it's got a very, very steep learning curve. It's open source, and so is the support open source. So um, uh, Blender Cam, if you'd like to give it a shot, uh, go for it. I took one look at it, decided it looked like it was trying to land a 747 and say, no thanks. So I'm going to yeah. learn SolidWorks and uh, do it in 3D Cam CAD and then try to import it that way. But again, I'm having to take a class to learn how to use SolidWorks. Yeah, and, and I'll just say, you know, I consider myself to be a pretty proficient user of SolidWorks. I've been using it a long time. But, you know, drawing a guitar neck, that's that's a pretty complicated little thing to draw. And, you know, you might be better off to try to find somebody who's already spent the time to model one and, you know, and then buy, you know, buy the file from them or, or whatever. Because, you know, that's, that's kind of like... Uh, that's that's a pretty complex piece. It's got so many, you know, contours and things. You know, when you look at a guitar neck, it's it's a weird shape and it's it's difficult to draw and it's, you know, difficult to program. So well, you're, one you're fighting of, off a lot to to chew there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one one of the things you could do is that if you went out to scorchworks.com and downloaded his free uh, probing program. And um, got, your, got yourself a probe, which it can be as simple as taking a sheet of tin foil and wrapping a, a a guitar neck with it, and using a bit basically to be your touch probe. Actually, use his program and map the entire uh, program and save that code. You could then duplicate that uh, that yeah, uh, guitar neck, and you could do that for free. Okay. Yeah, so that's a lot I, of work. I, I was going to say, you know, you can use a uh, a non CNC type uh, duplicator. Uh, you know, yeah. I, some people call them copy carver type things, mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's a good. Of course, you got to have a, a guitar neck to start with, but but that's a lot faster than than doing it with a CNC. You still have, you're still going to have to sand it no matter what, whether you use a CNC or a, a duplicator or whatever, but but yeah, it's it's a complicated part to draw and, and to program. So it'd be yeah. almost easier building it with just traditional tools, you know. Well, yeah, that's that's why you don't find any luthiers that use uh, CNCs. You know, they probably build it faster. 
because they build so many of them without without using that. When they get into production, they'll usually pick up a CNC and get going on that, but they have somebody else who will draw it and model it for you. Um, now, it, it, and the hard part of it is, is not so much the shape, the outline, or anything. You can model the flat back of a headstock all day long. You can model the flat back of a heel all day long. It's that transition from that round neck to that flat heel that is harder than heck to model because it bends in about three different directions all at the same time. And even a program like Aspire just will not do that by itself. Um, the, now there's a gentleman, if you want to buy plans, there's a gentleman who advertises on YouTube all the time. He's down in Brazil. His name is Alex Navarro. He charges like $60, $65 for a set of guitar plans and they're well worth the money. If he doesn't have what you're looking for, he will do a custom guitar plan for you for whatever um, for whatever kind of guitar you want. And anywhere starts at about $150. But if you're really thinking about making that many guitars that you want to see and see plan for the neck, um, that's money well spent because it's going to cost you a lot more in time, effort, and energy than $125 to or $150 to custom. Uh, do a custom guitar drawing, you know. Okay. Yeah. And he does excellent work. He really does excellent work. And his name is Alex Navarro, and he's all over YouTube. Okay. Yeah, we've got uh, here. We're again, like always, we're running over here a little bit, and I look, we got like 50 viewers or something. I appreciate you guys hanging around and listening to us and asking questions and stuff like that. I see. I got one more question over here in the chat. Uh, that I wanted to address here. I can't. Let me see if I can put my glasses on. See. Oh, that's Rick Nolan. Okay. Hey, Rick. Uh, he's saying with a new CNC build, uh, the table plans will cut a four by four piece. Uh, and the reason I want to talk about this, the plans, and he and he's talking about those new uh, plywood plans uh, that I got out there. Uh, the plans call for the table to be made from exactly a half sheet of plywood, 48 inches by 48 inches. And I did that on purpose so that if somebody wanted to go to Lowe's or Home Depot and, you know, pick up exactly a half sheet, they could do that and not have to uh, cut it at all. They could use that as their table. But if you want this plan to cut uh, a 4 by 4 then you're going to need to stretch it out wider and again it's just simple math you know if you want it you know it's four it's four but the table's four or four if you need a five foot table you just make it another foot longer so uh, you can make it whatever you want those plans are just kind of uh, you know like I said make it easy where it's going to use exactly a half sheet of plywood for the table if you want to make it bigger or smaller or whatever you can make it that way I made it where it's really easy to uh, change the size both directions. Okay, I don't see any other questions over in the chat. Carl Larson wants to know what the best thing he missed. He just got there. Uh, the best thing you missed was the video that Juan gave us. Yeah. But he, he has over on, uh, <laughs> I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, Juan, over on your YouTube channel you've got a video, correct? When, the one where you did the, uh, where, you, where you had your calipers laid down there, or no? Uh, no, I just put that on Facebook. I, I will be putting them up, though. Okay, yeah. It, I, I got to tell you guys, if you're, the people over in the chat, you need to subscribe to Juan's channel because he's yes. he puts a lot of, uh, you know, all the stuff he, he demonstrates here, he's, he's got over there, too, or will have. So, uh Scroll up into the chat to UCG Code One Design. Click his name, and it'll take you to his uh, channel. Absolutely, G Code Man's Dynamite. G Code yep. One Design. That's right. Thanks. There guys. is one last question. If you think you have time, uh, Dave. Oh, we'll we'll make it, time. It's a, it's a good one from Trevor Burke. He was just wanting to know if any of you with a CNC have a scheduled maintenance plan. Maintenance? What? What's maintenance? What's maintenance on your CNC. Uh, I'll let you know when I reach that interval. I've been doing <laughs> it for like ten years. 
I changed the oil every 3,000 miles. <laughs> so uh, I'm taking that as a no. <laughs> uh, I, you know, a lot of people when I was selling, even when I was selling the Sidewinder machines before, they'd say, "Well, what, you know, what kind of maintenance should I do?" And I'm like, uh, "You know, blow it off once in a while, or yeah, you know, sweep the sawdust off around it, or something." There's not a lot of maintenance to these things. Um, and I, I get what he's saying, uh, you know, uh, lubrication, et cetera, et cetera. Every once in a while, I will, and, and I can't be any more specific than say every once in a while, I will grab the Allen wrench and go over and check the uh, screws on my couplers just to make sure nothing's backing off. Every once in a while, I'll go uh, just try uh, a nut on one of the V-groove bearings to see if any of them have loosened up. I check nuts and bolts on the motors. I don't have any specific interval. It's just uh, every so often. I don't know. I would say maybe twice a month, if that. And I very rarely find anything, which is why I'm starting to do it even less and less. But when I first got the machine built, I did it more often because things are going to break in. They're going to wear wear in together. You've got two items that have never been put together before. They got to kind of marry one another. You know, you you'll be tightening uh, couplers a little bit because you didn't tighten it enough, or you know, a, a V groove bearing is going to need adjustment or something like that. But after a few months, it just needs to be less and less. You know, if you see something, fix it. But uh, other than that, they're pretty maintenance free. If you're not, you know, if you're not trying to grind engine, you know, engine parts on it, you're you got to be pretty good. Yeah, I, I used to, when I first started up a machine, I would take a little dab of white lithium grease and put on the lead screws, and I don't even bother doing that anymore. It just seems like the, I mean, the lithium grease, you know, will spread out and get all in the thing, but then it makes all the dust stick to it better, yep. so uh, I just quit, kind of quit doing that, just leave them. I mean, pretty much dry, I guess. I mean, I guess you could, you know, if, if you're in a high humidity place, you could every once in a while spray a little WD-40 on them and wipe them down a little bit or something, but there's really not a lot of maintenance that needs to be done to these things, especially if you're using it fairly regular. It's, it's going to be fine. Yeah. I could see if it was a air-powered machine, you know, as far as it needed air in order for it to to stay working, but... Routers electric, everything yeah. else is mechanical. I've, I've done that. way more maintenance to my actual Porter cable router yeah. than I have my machine, you know, because I've had to, you know, every gazillion hours have to put a new set of brushes in them, and that's that's probably way more maintenance than I do on the the whole CNC. Now, when I take a router bit out of the collet, I take the collet completely out and blow it out with an air hose. I check the V yeah. bearings every once in a while just to see yeah. if they're free spin. Yeah. Might come, might come loose every once in a while. I put super glue on them, on the on the threads. Uh huh. Nylock nuts. That's about it. Nylock yeah. nuts, they don't come on. I I usually tell if I if I see a nut laying on my table, that yeah maybe I should do some maintenance <laughs> and see where it came from. <laughs> and, and, and it's like I yeah it's like I was talking with somebody on Facebook. I says you know if a nut falls off of the V groove bearing, it's not like blowing a tire on turn four at Talladega. Okay, <laughs> if that 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 bolt's gonna back out, you're gonna see it. Yeah. You are gonna see it. <laughs> so and yes, I Rick Nolan, I agree. Put a sealer on the plywood. <laughs> Finish the plywood. When yeah, I, they're talking uh, talking about the mm -hmm. liquid cooled spindle mm -hmm. over there too. Yeah, I think they're talking amongst themselves. Y'all go okay. ahead. Yeah, <laughs> they do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trevor, okay, Watson, guys, we've yeah. got we've still got fifty five viewers here, and we're getting ready to sign off here. But, uh, anybody watching. got anything else they want to say? Russ, you've been kind of quiet tonight. Uh, I was thinking about uh, when y'all were talking about doing uh, something as far as maintenance, but the lead screws, uh, how about graphite? That doesn't seem to uh, gather dust or whatever, but it might help. Until lubricate. you lean up against it and get a black stripe down the side of your... Well, I'm just... Yeah. You know, just 
Just keep them clean pretty much, right? Yeah, basically. Yeah, I, about the most cleaning I do is like, you know, especially because if I'm not running any kind of dust shoe or anything, as Russ alluded to earlier, I make a big mess. Uh, and, you know, I just shut the controller off and, uh, you know, back it out of the way, shut the controller off, and then get the shop back and suck it all up. And I always kind of hit the lead screws and everything, and that's that's about as close to thing to maintenance as I'll do. Yeah. So. Blow it off with an air hose. And I do the same thing with my router. Trevor's over there asking now, do you ever needed to replace the bearings in a router? Uh, I've been doing this for 40 years plus, playing around with routers and woodworking tools. I've replaced bearings twice. In a professional shop, you might replace them every five or six years if you're using it every single day. It just depends on how much use you have on it and what kind of use it is. I mean, I know people that are using Porter cable routers that are 30 years old. They blow out the motor uh, with the air hose and replace the brushes if they need to be replaced. Uh, yes, you can tell if a bearing's gone just from the noise it makes. You learn to, the sound of a router by uh, in distress just by listening to it. And if there's something wrong, unplug it, go down to Lowe's, get you a new one, and rebuild the one that needs rebuilding. It's just that simple that way. I mean. Yeah, I, I've never had to put. I haven't reached the point, I guess, where I've had to put new bearings in a router or anything. I, I'm just, you know, put new brushes in when it quits running. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. No. You know, and I am a big fan of Porter Cable. If anybody's thinking about a router for their CNC. Same here, and that's what I've been referring to as a Porter Cable 690 because you can get them for $150, $160 locally. And the thing will outlive all of us. Uh, you know, it, it, to completely overhaul a Porter Cable router is bearings and brushes. And that's it. And yeah. brushes are what? $12 a set. And I think bearings are maybe $25 for a set. You never had armature burnout? I've never had one, no. I've never had one. Now, maybe I'm lucky. I don't know. But I, I've never had one. Well, since we're talking about routers right now, because like I said, we still got 50 some people watching here. Does, it, does anybody else uh, use anything on the top of their router like I do, or am I just an oddball? Getting ready to. Never mind. Don't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you're not an oddball. You're a ball odd. Yeah. Uh -oh. What do you uh -oh. have on top of your router? Off goes the gloves. I I have a I have a piece of t-shirt material. And a little zip tie that I kind of stick over the top of the router as a filter to keep the big junk out. And I've been doing doing that. Well, I haven't done it on the ones out in the garage, but the one out in my shop, I've done that because you know the router's you know sucking in stuff from the top and blowing it out through the bottom. And I figure, well, you know, why not put some kind of little filter on there? So, especially when you're cutting MDF and everything, you'd be amazed when you get when you get done, and you pull that off. It's it's got a lot of crap on it. So. Can't be good going through a router the way I look at it. So if, if you got a good dust shoe, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that's true, but I don't hardly ever run. <laughs> I like to make a mess. What's a dust shoe? Amen. <laughs> okay, folks. I guess uh, if we're running out of questions here. Yep. Hey, there's somebody else that says I use a cloth over mine. Yeah, there we go. See, I'm not so weird. <laughs> I was oh, going to so say, when we were cutting the, that stuff in the garage, that one in the garage didn't have no cloth over it. Uh, no. no, we were, uh, yeah, we made a big mess out there. But that's all part of your training, Russ. You know, you got to learn how to use the shop vac, too. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, I guess that's going to do it for tonight. I appreciate everybody hanging around. appreciate the panel. Patrick, good to have you on tonight, buddy. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, I guess that's it. We'll see you next week. Take care, buddy. Don't forget a thumbs up as you exit Peace the day. theater, folks. Thank you, and have a good night. Good night.